Welcome back, everyone. The World Cup never lets up with its surprises. Today, we're feeling Spain, but the S is silent. Uh, Oscar, Spain are out. You call this Morocco beating them on penalties. Yassim Bono, the Sevilla man, being the man of the match. He had a, he had a dream night against, or dream day against Spain, especially from a guy who plays against Spain, who plays against these guys. Mm -hmm. And God, where, where did Spain go wrong? And where did Morocco go so right? Spain went wrong in the fact that they just made, they were too easy for Morocco to defend. The tempo was too slow. The defenders didn't move the ball fast enough, neither the midfielders and the forwards were just too static. Like all these things combined is the perfect scenario for any defense. All you have to do is just defend the odd cross that comes into the box and Morocco are pretty good at that. So. Yeah, it's all boiled down to Morocco knowing that they'd be okay with penalties while Spain giving past penalty history. You know, they tried to do it in normal time and extra time, but then they just weren't able to. And we saw a penalty shootout that was just so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I need to, I need to get, I hope I can get a good night's sleep to forget all of these <laughs> terrible penalties from. <laughs> because this match day we saw a lot of you know, poorly taking pens. Yeah, when, when your team misses all your penalties, that's that's something, isn't it? And uh, let's with Spain. My and I've I've told this to you off air and and the guys off air. But my gripe with Spain was, first of all, I feel in terms of the attack, they weren't they just weren't brave enough. They were too predictable in terms of certain mm -hmm. ball. Like, for example, if, let's say, Pedro wanted to give a pass to Nico Williams or Ferran, first Pedro passed to Sergio Busquets, then he passed to Gavi, then he passed to Ferran. And, like, you could have made the same pass with a long ball. So things like that where they were too <laughs> horizontal in their passing, yeah. too predictable, the defenders mm -hmm. didn't know every sequence that they were going through. And as you mentioned, in, in attack, I don't feel they were brave enough. I don't think they really fully went for Morocco. And every time, let's say, Morocco attacked, they never really got the counter going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was too like they always took this. They took the short option way too many times for my liking, and they didn't switch play enough. And there were, they don't, it's not that they weren't options for the switch of play. There were options. They just chose not to do it, which I felt was strange. So, yeah, yeah. but that's what you get when you can't finish stuff in normal time. And the penalties are. A lottery, even if you practice it, practice a thousand of them. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like the Spanish players did any practice. I mean, you can practice penalties all you want, but that tension, <laughs> especially in a stadium which was mom, like essentially a Morocco home game, that oh, tension yeah. you can't replace it at all. Yeah, yeah, it really felt like a Morocco home game. And the one one last thing I want to hammer on with the Spanish team is that, uh, and I, I've picked on them. Danny Omar, I don't understand why he stays on the pitch for the time he does. And also, I felt there was such a mismatch between Morocco's right side and Spain's left side. Because on Morocco's right side, you have Ziyech, you have Hakimi, two very quick players, very fast players. And then you're going against Omo, who's slower than both of them. Mm -hmm. The Alba, who is aged toad in this game, I felt. And mm -hmm. he, he did play well, but like in terms of being that bumbling left back that you usually for Barcelona, it showed none of that in this game. And mm -hmm. it's just, that was super easy for Morocco. And you told that when um, Nico Williams came on, you saw the impact he had for Spain's right side and on Morocco's left. And you saw that kind of impact. But on the left side for Spain, there was none of that. Yeah, I felt like he could, I felt like he could have moved on to another position and just put a better matchup for Hakimi on that wing. Or, you know, not uh, taking him off earlier, but yeah. unfortunately, what happened, happened. <laughs> yeah. A any, any like words for your boy, Gabby and Pedri? They're getting lots of stake at, at the moment. Uh, I, I, I feel I, I I feel I feel like criticizing any Spain player is fair, but calling to play talented, trying to insult to play talented players just because they don't play for a club is pretty expected. So <laughs> I mean, I don't think we should 
pay too much attention to that. Just some angry Madridistas. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's it's not like there are any Spanish Madrid midfielders to that they're keeping off the team, so I don't get it. No, no. The anyway, the intro goes far back beyond our time. Uh, Lumi, um, what do you think about the Spain performance? So I say, what you said again? What do you think about the Spain performance? Yeah, it just the urgency was lacking. You you would think they were playing like their second game or something in the World Cup, where you know we just. You know, we'll play, we'll pass around. Maybe these players will, you know, like run out of energy and stop tracking us or stop sitting back, like try to, you know, maybe, you know, press us. Like um, Morocco are very um, comfortable, you know, just allowing Spain, like play in front of them. Because like you guys said it earlier, there were really no balls, you know, in behind, sort of breaking the lines oftentimes, like, or no one trying to, you know, Play on on the shoulder of the defender. Like it wasn't it wasn't very often that that happened in Spain games. So it was very it was very toothless in in many in many ways. Yeah. Um, I wonder if, and I think my analysis probably true. Or my guess is that I think Morocco had more sort of clear cut chances to actually win that game. But you know, I think their striker was. Didn't take the chances um, well enough, you know. Yeah. Kind of fell to his feet. So, and like I said, the goalkeeper was like amazing. I mean, you know, he did his definitely did his homework. You know, playing yeah. against all these players in the Spanish league. Yeah, he definitely did. And we're going to talk about Yasin Bono and Oscar Bono. He's he's a goalkeeper who I feel is very underrated. Let's not forget it was last season Zamora in La Liga and. Mm -hmm. You could clearly tell he knew exactly where all the players were going, especially a guy like Soler, who scores so many penalties. And as you mentioned off air, like Bono's ability to just get into his head. Yeah, it was a masterclass from Bono. But again, I feel when a penalty is saved, you have to look at two things. Was the penalty a good penalty? That's the first question. I don't think any of those penalties were particularly good in the first place. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, as a, as a fan of this national team, it's pretty frustrating to go up like this again. But yeah, it is. You no, know, once they couldn't do it in 120 minutes, I immediately calmed down and accepted what was going to happen, <laughs> and just went and just went for a walk while the penalty shootout was happening. When I came back, I was like, ah, um, I came back for like the third one. I was like, oh, okay, let's see if they can make this one count, and they didn't. So. Yeah, it's what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. I think I'll be right in saying that out of the times they've made it past the quarter, past the group stages, three out of the five times they've gone out have been through the penalty shootout. So, um, it's definitely something that's not going well. For the, the New England. <laughs> yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe, but but you know what? This it's funny in this side of the of the like uh, of the competition, Spain, Morocco, and Portugal. They're all neighboring countries, so. Mm -hmm. It's going to be like another somewhat derby when Morocco plays Portugal and Olympic Portugal. They had something that I didn't think they had in them. They had goal today. And maybe that has to do with resting Cristiano Ronaldo. Who knows? Right? Yeah. I don't think it was more. I don't think it was a, you know, resting situation, more of a tactical <laughs> change, which definitely proved, you know, dividends for the coach. Like he's. I think everyone now, you know, like world media was probably like just waiting to pen papers and, you know, push the stories that, oh, how can you bench Ronaldo, da, 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 your star man and everything like that. And then for them to, you know, trounce, trounce um, Switzerland so, the way they did, which they, I think we were talking about earlier, that they were a tricky side to face, especially yeah. how, you know, difficult they have been so far to sort of break down. Um, and on this, onto that last game, you know, where it was kind of like a free for all to some yeah. degree. But uh, yeah, he definitely is vindicated by his choice. And it's just a wonderful thing to have someone like that, even if it's Ronaldo coming off the bench. Because as far as I'm concerned, I, again, I'm a Ronaldo fan, mm -hmm. but I can't, but like, I can't deny how 
sort of fluid their motion, their, their like attacking play was um, without Ronaldo on the pitch. And I think he also has to sort of learn, actually try to learn from this guy. Whereas like you know, every time you know, the ball comes to your feet that you try to make it work for you, you know, that sort of thing. And yeah. Credit to Ramos, he was clinical. Like, he had a couple of chances. I think he could have had, like, four goals easily. Like, you know, one-on-ones that he had. Summer was huge, even though, you know, like, it wasn't his best showing. But he did make some very critical saves for Portugal. I'm uh, sorry, for Switzerland. So, yeah, they definitely have a lot of, like, things, good things going for them, you know, pending their match against Morocco. Yeah, and a special mention for Ramos because Ramos has had such a great season for Benfica. Benfica, as you know, they made it out of their group with PSG and Juventus in the Champions League, and he's played a big part in, in that side. I don't think they've lost the game, actually. So um, he's definitely having a big season, and he's possibly becoming one of these forwards that a lot of clubs from a lot of top clubs from the European top five leagues will want. And do you see him in some way making that? Big age after this World Cup, or do you think it's a case where he waits for the end of the season with Benfica? I think Benfica would definitely want to not want to sell him right now because of you know the position they are in in terms of the Champions League, the the possibility of going far. So they they wouldn't want to let go of a player like that right now. Yeah. But he's definitely helping his case, you know, as that for such a young player, you know, to make his name you know, in this sort of stage in the World Cup, it's very very impressive. So he's definitely, you know, another well, Ben I don't know if he came from the like academy in Benfica, but man, seems like, you know, mm-hmm. players that come from like Benfica, like just always turn out to be world beaters. I mean, you know, just yeah. look at Yao Felix and stuff. So um, Has Jao Felix impressed you in, in this World Cup? Because we, myself and Oscar, we've been critical of him for showing in La Liga with Atletico, but it seems like maybe there's a different sort of air with Portugal. Yeah, I think in many ways, I think because his maybe how prideful he might feel in Atletico. He can't necessarily feel that way in Portugal because, I mean, with Ronaldo there, I think his pride alone kind of, you know, is probably more than half the team in, in that <laughs> regard. But so, you know, just maybe he tries to humble himself in that regard. But his approach is definitely different. Like you said, yeah, playing for Portugal and how he's played for Atletico Madrid thus far. And he, he seems to just be willing to, you know, like go out there and perform, like, you know, as opposed to, you know, kind of self-serving in a way, which is yeah. good, obviously, for the for the team. Sure. And what do you think Portugal has to do differently to avoid what happened to Spain? I think they're definitely going to be more direct. You, you just, I, when you think about the pace they have as well, like um, Rafael Guerrero, you know, um, um, Dalo has been playing really well for them right back, probably one of the best right backs in this tournament. I mean, Shout out to Akimi as well, but um, uh, yeah, they've been they have a lot of pace, you know, like going forward, very sort of creative, and with Yao Felix, Bruno Fernandes playing really awesome football right now. So they have a lot of things going for them. Um, I I don't see how you know Morocco would survive the onslaught, and I mean even going you know defensively, they had they did like falter, you know, in terms of. Actually, funny enough, the best side defensively has been Morocco in, in like thus far in the World Cup. So yeah. it's going to be a different challenge as well, like you said, for Portugal going, um, you know, facing them now. But I think they have enough weapons, you know. I mean, boy, Rafa Leal came on, scored. He just seems like <laughs> he just does, you know, like all that, all that, like that example about you know, people submitting the homework later and <laughs> getting credit. He just seems to show up and <laughs> just get a go and then, you know, bow for the night. It's, it's, it's awesome. So they definitely have, you know, lots of goal scorers in that team. Yeah, I wonder which, which, whether any of us had Gonzalo Ramos as top scorer for the World Cup. I think not. <laughs> no. Mbappé. No. Mbappé is the yeah. guy. Mbappé. Mbappé. Yeah, and Mbappé, who, who was, like, on fire against uh, 
Poland. He scored two goals. He was very clinical for them, for France. And like Portugal, like Brazil, who we'll get onto, France also look, they look pretty good. Then they, Makara? Yeah, France looked very, very impressive, particularly. It took them a little bit of time to get going. But one interesting thing about just knockout competition in general is like since I think 1998, there's been 24 knockout games from the winners. And out of all of those games, 17 clean sheets have been recorded, which is like really impressive. Wow. So, I mean, when you consider the fact that defensively France are structured so well, getting, you know, an absolute gem of a player like Antoine Griezmann doing defensive duty where, you know, you guys can get the ball and just play Mbappe in space, essentially. When, like, Dembele, Mbappe, and Griezmann aren't, you know, asked to create is just very difficult to deal with. Yeah. And it, it felt that way for Poland. But I do think Poland, compared to the game against Argentina, they showed more of themselves in this game. They made things difficult for France. It wasn't a walkover for France. Yeah, uh, us, yeah, they were, Poland were a lot, I mean, I think we kind of all said off the record that Poland were the team that, like, seemed uh, the weakest out of all the knockout teams thus far, yeah. but they, they performed quite, especially with the Argentina game, they were quite woeful, to be frank, but yeah, they were, they were pretty, pretty impressive, I thought, in the first half, yeah. just, you know, this couple Kylian Mbappe just, <laughs> wonder goals almost in a way just his, yeah. how he's just able to kind of just deceive Chesney with I think it was a second or first one I'm getting them mixed up but that's uh, just, uh, yeah that's both, just, of, both of them are outstanding yeah which, which one do you think was better I think the one where it's just everyone is under the impression he's going to curl it to the back post and just this is yeah just goes on the near post essentially yeah. that, that's just something about that is just so fascinating yeah, that's fascinating. And it's brought up, it's, it's a shame Holland can be in this World Cup because maybe it would have been about them them competing for the World Cup rather than the old guard, Messi or Ronaldo. But it's just something about Mbappe that he's just, you can tell like he's just a player cut above the rest. Yeah, he certainly looked it thus far. Yeah. And after this showing by France and seeing the rest, do you think now they have more chance of... Um, making it a win in the World Cup, or do you feel they're still yet to be tested? Uh, I still would. I mean, they've clearly shown that they're, uh, you know, a clear-cut contender. I think part of the issue prior to the tournament was the whole, like, curse of former winners essentially going out in the group stage. Plus, they, France as well had a lot of um, off-the-pitch sort of issues, per se. Um, and they have yeah, they, injuries as well. Yeah, and the whole yeah. Oh my gosh, that's probably the most uh, important aspect. Um, per, I mean, the center midfield essentially, Pogba and Conte, who are just clear cut, like world class yeah. players. Yeah, and the um, they got Benzema too. Couldn't make it. Yeah, but I actually think in a way Giroud makes them click a bit better. That might sound just crazy to say. No, it's not crazy at all. He is the all-time top scorer for the French national team. And I, I feel maybe Giroud, because of the way he's built, is quite underrated because he, here's a guy who's won league titles with Montpellier in France, which is difficult to do. Uh, with Milan last season, he scores as many goals as he does for France. He's won a World Cup before. And yeah, so like maybe you're right, because when Benzema was there in Euro 2021, or 2020, whatever, they, they didn't really play as well as they're doing right now. Yeah, you know, for sure, I'm with you on that. It's almost where, like, he's not as mobile nearly as Benzema. Benzema, what makes Benzema, like, incredible is his ability to kind of roam into deep pockets in midfield. Yeah. Whereas, like, Giroud, when he's just kind of stationed up front, occupying, or kind of, like, pinning both center backs, yeah. When you have players like Dembele and Mbappe with just that much space, essentially, yeah. where it's just, you know, it's only like one of the center midfielders helping in the fullback usually. It's just, just 
<laughs> you're almost like praying essentially they don't come running at you with the ball yeah and i feel on that point like going out to i think the second or third french goal Giroud makes a run and that frees up the space for i believe it was mbappe's for mbappe and he scores and that's just the kind of movement that he gives for france and given that griezmann is playing so deep maybe France might not need a Benzema who's dropping deep and roaming around because you already have that own Griezmann who can do that, who can pass the ball well, and who can connect to the attack. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with that completely. So, but the next next up for France is England, which is a massive test. And before I go on to them, I just want to get your opinion on how you feel that game will go from a French perspective. I mean, this will certainly be their most difficult game thus far, without question. Um, I think Lumi, they might actually kind of know some of this better than I would, but I think a lot of the curiosity of this is trying to predict what formation England are going to go out with. Yeah. Because if it's a back three slash five, that means France are going to essentially not, they won't be... um, given nearly as much space as they have been yeah. in the group games in this Poland game, which is a different style of playing, right? Where you're essentially trying to break a team down. That, that is true. And what about England? I mean, they seemed like it was all easy for them against Senegal, 3-0, thank you, through to the quarterfinals. How do you see, like, how do you, do you see their performance in that game? And how do you see them going forward? Yeah, they definitely turned up. I mean, Jude Bellingham, one of the people that I think spoke about would be like a key player for them. Um, Phil Foden as well was also you know, very much in the in the mix of things. Um, Harry Kane finally got, got his goal, finally. Yeah. Now he's not picked to actually win the Golden Boot. Yeah. Uh, I had him too, I had him too. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But... Um, yeah, it seems like they're clicking, you know. Um, and like I think what like what Mikhail said. Okay, let me talk about I guess against Senegal. They really played well. Um, and I don't think there were any, there were you know really sort of challenged at any point in that game. Um, I felt like they sort of grew into the game, you know. And once they got like the first one, I think the pressure and you know the tension on them sort of reduced and they were able to play more freely in, in a sense um so yeah i think i you know i don't think senegal really uh had a chance on on the night but uh looking forward to Fran- france you know um it's definitely a different challenge like miguel said and yeah depending on the formation um Sake decides to go with that for me decides how negatively like how negative minded or positive minded like the players would play in a sense where yeah he, I could see him playing you know wing backs Trippier Kyle Walker because I think he's going to want to play Kyle Walker as a center back ish role to counter Mbappe's speed but I don't know who you have on the other side to counter Dembele, but yeah. he's going to want to have Kyle Walker on the pitch and, you know, to kind of go toe-to-toe with Mbappe in that regard. You know, Maguire has no chance. <laughs> like, Especially, the thing with Dembele, though, is that as much of a great player he is, he's mm. such an inconsistent player. Like, you don't mm. know where you're going to get from him <laughs> from day to day. So if he's on form, then it's bad news for the for the left side of England, but if he's not on form, then they, they could have a pretty easy game. Yeah, hundred percent. Like you, for for a player that skilled, you know, two footed, he really should be on the same, like in the same level. Like, you know, the way we talk about Salah, you know, I think cutting on on his left, like Mbappe, I said Mbappe, Dembele, who is more two footed, you know, should be able to actually perform better or like you know to a, 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 the same standard. But like you said, he's inconsistent in many ways and has been injury prone um i think i won't be surprised if that going good game goes to extra time yeah. um just because of how i think england will try to frustrate you know france as much as possible and Mbappe try to keep him quiet as much as possible 
and they do have the potential, right? The potential to catch France on the break. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel, you know, like there is a chance for them to smash and grab, but my money wouldn't be on them to do that. I feel uh, with the tools France have, you know, Griezmann playing unbelievably well. And as well, Miguel talked about Giroud's um, importance to them, giving them that sort of focal point where he is able to do flick-ons, you know, win the ball in the air. And he's, you know, still very good from set pieces as well. So they have a lot of, like, you know, weapons to throw at England. And I think at the end of the day, they will get the, you know, win over England and face Portugal in the semifinals. And it seems like what that 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 side of the draw has turned out to be a monster side of the draw because <laughs> mm-hmm. of what we've seen. Uh, but let's let's move on to the other side of the draw, and I'm going to start with Argentina. Oscar, they they were played against Aus- Australia, and in the first half, they, it was sort of sort of labored, but then Messi scored, and then in second half, they made it two zero. Then Lautaro missed, <laughs> they missed a bunch. Australia scored, and there was so much. Tension with Argentina. At first, I was like super impressed, but after seeing what Australia did, my doubts about Argentina came back. Do you share those doubts? Mm, not necessarily. I know Australia have scored one, but the goal basically came from nothing. But and um, definitely, it was kind of like, like you said, the subs Argentina made were definitely ones that invited pressure and then being so defensive and whatnot. Yeah. So is there some defensive concern, especially against the Netherlands team who are very good in transitions? Yes. Is there concern going the other way? Not so much because Messi is playing well and they are creating chances. It's just mm-hmm. Lautaro didn't have his day, but no. ne- next time might be his day. Who knows? Yeah, there, there are lots of criticisms towards him. I've seen like people are saying like he's rubbish or stuff like that, but my opinion is that this is a guy who came into the World Cup as an absolute starter for Argentina. Mm-hmm. And in his first game, he's very unlucky to mm-hmm. not, not to score. His second game doesn't have his best game, and Julian Alvarez comes in and he does a good job. And he's a guy who's possibly lacked confidence because he feels that he needs to prove himself again to start over mm-hmm. or to be yeah. at the same level. In the coach's rank as Alvarez, and maybe mm-hmm. why he's missing the chances. He missed the chances that he missed because Lautaro, as people who watch it know, he's a killer on his day. Mm-hmm. I feel like Lautaro goes through like dips of like high confidence, high, rises of high confidence, and dips of low confidence. So I let's hope from Argentina standpoint he gets his groove back because having both him and Alvarez firing would definitely do them the world of good yeah definitely they do and one now you've seen this game from an argentina perspective how do you feel the game will go against the dutch okay i think this one is going to extra time again <laughs> i was spot on about the morocco spain one and i hope i'm right here in saying that argentina with a very motivated messi will just find a way to edge past them in extra time. I don't think this game is getting settled in 90 minutes because <laughs> the Dutch have a really good defense. Yeah. They get it'll probably be a score drug going into extra time, I think. Yeah. Because I, I feel their their goals either way. And the fact is that Louis Van Hal's Netherlands from 2014, they don't lose games in 90 minutes. No, they don't. The so last I- time they lost in quotes was to Argentina on penalties. So maybe the same thing will happen. Sure. And it's good for Argentina that they have someone like Martinez who in the Copa America is shown to be like a good goalkeeper in penalties. He's shown to be the kind of goalkeeper that can really psychologically um, deal with a, a, an opponent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know, I personally don't want it to get that far. <laughs> My two teams in this World Cup cannot be Cannot both go out on penalties. It will wreck me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and this time Van Hal doesn't have Tim Crow to play mind games with. <laughs> no, 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 no. But 
but Norpert in goal for um, Netherlands has been really impressive so far. So yeah, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And Mikhail, I, I'm sorry, I, I cursed your USA team by making my bold prediction in the last game, in the last podcast actually, but they got knocked out to the Netherlands. I thought I thought they did okay, especially when it was two one, but lapses and defenses really hurt them for that third goal. Yeah, three pretty basic defensive lapses, you'd say, um, in terms of just tracking your runner. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think overall they should be kind of proud uh, in the sense for how young they are, I guess. Um, they clearly struggled dealing with the fact that Netherlands kind of just said, like, we don't really care to have the ball, <laughs> which... Uh, you know, like essentially it comes down to like, how do we break you guys down essentially? Um, that's just Louis van Gaal tactics though. I mean, it kind of just showed when you have like a, you know, a former Champions League winning coach, um, they are just able to make just adjustments after like three days or, you know, with just a couple days preparation. Um, I mean, for the Dutch perspective going into Argentina, um oscar mentioned that the defense was very very good but it when you kind of have that combination with the fact that they again like when you have like world-class players and very good players and good players um that just are willing to play in the style like that where they don't really care to kind of possess the ball shall we say and kind of just rely on transitions essentially it makes for difficult um it makes for to be very difficult for your opposing player when they're trying to break you down yeah i have a question and this this can be for you or for anyone in the panel as well if you want to jive in but given what we've seen in this world cup and in general we all watch european football or club football and what we've seen in the past couple of years is possession football somewhat dead because or i guess dead is like very strong but like do you feel it's lost this impact that it used to have because we're seeing teams with lots of possession, but still losing games. And it's either teams that are like super defense or not super defensive, but like more counterattacking teams or I wouldn't, teams that are more pressing teams do well. I wouldn't say it's dead per se. What for international competitions or international fo- or football in general, tactics are usually a bit slower to kind of, um, take precedent compared to club football so you know the biggest sort at least my sort of biggest um um interpretation of this world cup is particularly the role of pressing and the counter pressing in higher areas of the pitch for example you know all we've seen it with we, we see it quite clearly with a lot of the good teams, you know, particularly Brazil, Portugal showed it. I don't want to say every team, you know, outside of like Spain and Argentina until they put in Julian Alvarez also struggled with this, where when you win the ball high up, all, all you need to do is like have one pass here, one pass there, and you have a goal scoring opportunity, essentially. Yeah, that's. I mean, that I think it's just vital nowadays and kind of going to like, or yeah, I mean, that's just a vital element. At least that's something I think is the case here. But yeah. I wonder, I'm curious what Lumi and Oscar actually think about sure. this. Yeah, really sure, because sure, the reason why I'm bringing the question up is like, we've seen Spain go out with a thousand passes. Germany goes out and they criticized by adopting a Spanish style. And you've just mentioned how the U.S. went out or because... US went out, even though they had more of the ball, and it seemed like the Netherlands were just inviting them to attack and they weren't able to break them down. But yeah, like Lumi, you want you had an opinion on this? Yeah, I was gonna say, like, uh, I definitely don't think it's dead because if you look at you know how Man City sort of play, at least in the Premier League, um, still very much possession based. Um, the thing is, the difference is there is a lot less, especially if you look at how Spain played, square passes. There's always, okay, it might be maybe three or four square passes. And then that one 
sort of square pass before you know it there's a like reverse pass you know to break the line someone always still trying to break you know the defensive line to move shape or kind of drag someone out of position i know gradually sort of uses that sort of deep lying sort of um midfielder run to sort of break and drag people out of position to now kind of pull the defense one way so when you think of that and like i think michael said as well like pressing is I think it's like the, the way to go if you have the personnel to kind of do it because sometimes it's like, okay, I think the way England play these days, it's more, okay, from the halfway line is when we kind of congest the pitch. So we would let you kind of do it, like let you play, you know, on your in your half. So I think, well, the closer I get to the halfway line, this closer they try to like step up and try to be in your face and everything. So they are kind of different tactics. The personnel you have obviously goes a long way in, you know, um, determining how you play but it's definitely not dead um, I think the, the key thing is being knowing the right time to like try to find the man like play that through a ball play that ball over the top which yeah. I think Spain did if Morata played I think for most of this game would like giving her that option a lot more often than having you know Danny Almo playing up front or Predri at some point um, yeah. but yeah that's my point yeah, uh, Oscar. Any opinions or? Uh, I kind of agree with them. Like, it's not like there's a there's room for both vertical and possession based football, and pressing is very important. I feel it's it's easier to do in club level than in international level. Yeah, but at the same time, I feel like it's not that. It's just the execution matters. Like the execution Spain had today versus in their first game was night and day so yeah yeah but then that, that's a beautiful thing about football there's so many ways to win so yeah there, i don't think one way is correct true there's so many ways to win but the one country that seems to have to play the beautiful way is brazil and Macau, brazil sure did do that right against uh, south korea it was dead by half time yeah that first half was something special. I mean, it was the best first half we've seen from anyone thus far. I wouldn't quite go so far to say it's the best overall performance. I think Portugal could, uh, against um, Switzerland kind of showed that. <laughs> but yeah, they were just lights out in that first half. Yeah. And given what we've seen with Brazil, like given the fact that Neymar's there, they're Ultra attacking style of play that we've seen. How can any team in their side of the bracket stop them? Because on the other side, I can see some teams matching up with them either tactically or in terms of players. But even with Argentina, like I struggle to look for reasons why they're going to stop this Brazil side. Yeah, it's tough to say. Like they're, I mean, with how good they are offensively, I think it's also important to note, like, defensively, just the positions that the defenders take up where it's, you don't have those flying fullbacks, right? It's like the fullbacks are essentially in a position where they are countering, like, a counterattack, essentially. And then you have Casemiro just in front of, like, those, what, four players. So it's just, it's very difficult um, for them to just, get broken down with again the attacking talent that they have just individual like talent just to have like Vinicius, Neymar and you know, this version of Rafinha for Brazil is actually like really really good yeah uh, he, hasn't, also, he hasn't hit the ground running yet at Barcelona but I mean he he's just fit right in with this Brazilian squad yeah he's been he's been very good like compared to the guy we see who couldn't cross hit a corner for against Inter, like you're seeing this guy playing with full, full of confidence. Uh, Vinicius and Richarlison too, they have also been like really full of confidence. Vinicius especially because before this World Cup, he never um, really played at this level for Brazil, but now he scored a goal in the first in the World Cup. He provides a beautiful assist for Paqueta's goal. It, yeah, it, it's fun to watch. Yeah, the timing with Vinicius has been brilliant because he's. I think he didn't play um in the third game where they lost against Ghana with the squad rotation but in the three games he this has been like probably this has been his like best three games I'd say with Brazil thus far 
um again like it just takes usually sometimes it just takes a while to kind of translate your club form to international form but just just the timing that it's happening now it's working perfectly for him yeah it is working perfectly and oscar i'm going to transition to Korea show japan um this was another game where it was a tie and it went to penalties and how do you read penalties here versus the ones <laughs> that were played in the spain game why are you doing this to me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to remember any of them. <laughs> but when, after the Japan game yesterday, I told someone, there's no way we are ever going to see a penalty shoot at this bad at this level. But Spain <laughs> said, hold my sangria. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a shame because Japan did really, really well to get this far. You know, they played I think they played better in Croatia over the 120 minutes. It's 120 minutes, right? Yes. So, but at the end, they did terrible penalties, just let them down. Uh, that's heartbreaking, man. <laughs> yeah, terrible penalties let them down. But for Croatia, do you think there's any chance they can stop this Brazil side? There's always a chance, but I feel like the fact that they've had to play extra time and go to the stress of penalties might come back to bite them against Brazil. Also, the fact that a point that was made, that, a point that I noticed in their game against Japan was that Japan had rotated their squad more during this group stage game. So they were more fresher than Croatia, who kind of looked leggy at times. So we'll see. Yeah. Croatia, Croatia do have one thing going for them, that the first like when Brazil meets an, a European team in the knockout stage, that's when they usually go out. So Croatia will be hoping that that's true. But yeah. then, you know, the World Cup curse and the, the World Cup champions curse ended this tournament. So <laughs> sure. basically, I'm saying, you know, Brazil are going to be in the semi final if they turn up smiling the way they did against South Korea. <laughs> so Brazil are going to Brazil are going to see the quarter for a semi final. That's what you're saying. I'm not saying Argentina are going to go through. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's, let's not count our, chick, uh, count our chickens before they hatch. Yeah, true. We, we is is it eggs podcast. or chicken? Whatever. Yeah. Eggs. We, we learned our lesson on this podcast. Eliminate, do you think Croatia have any chance of stopping Brazil? Um, I think they, their best bet is extra time, if anything. <laughs> like, because I think that's sort of start saying that they haven't won a game. Like, the last. I mean, when I mean, look back to their Euro run, right? Yeah. They didn't win a game in like regular time. So yeah. it was all like extra time. And so, you know, that that would be their kind of saving grace. So like, okay, if we can just keep them to extra time, maybe, you know, the stars are aligned again for us and then we can kind of let it happen. I know, I think Oscar's mindset now is to not hope. <laughs> so yeah, he's no. doing that thing where he just doesn't have hope. You know, no, no. <laughs> No, no, no. Oh, yeah. No, I, I definitely, I, I genuinely believe Brazil will beat Croatia in 19 minutes, but I'm just trying to give Croatia like <laughs> some comfort. I'm saying the only comfort they have is in a like stats, and we know stats and historical stuff don't really matter in football. So, yeah, yeah no. I'm saying it's, I'm saying they're going home. <laughs> no, I agree with you. I'm, I'm yeah. talking about your pick. For Argentina, I guess we haven't we haven't made our picks yet officially. <laughs> but if I hear anything other than Argentina, I know you are not saying it with your chest. But carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I said Argentina with my chest. I said they'll do it in extra time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was even specific. Yeah, I think one thing is that with uh, with Croatia, the last World Cup. All their games went to extra time. So, so they're specialists at this. So you're right. If they do go to extra time against Brazil and they go to penalties, maybe it's one of those things. Because they have the midfield that can at least retain the ball, that I can at least can fight against Brazil's pressing and counter pressing. Mm-hmm. Like Mikhail, what do you think about this? It's hard to say because Oscar, I think, said maybe the most important point in terms of Croatia 
is they look the last two games they they look really tired. I mean, the Belgium game I think just had Lukaku just finished one of the chances. You know, any mm-hmm. other day, uh, they wouldn't necessarily have gotten out. And even against Japan, just they were tired. Like I was kind of astonished that they took out Modric and Kovacic. I think. It might have been even just prior to extra t- or um, extra time, yeah. And then in addition to that element is like Brozovic, I think just ran the like most or covered the most distance in the game in World Cup history, wow. with like sixteen point seven kilometers, which is a lot. So it's just when you only have like a few days. I mean, they have I guess one more day recovery time. I'm not sure what day. It- the game is well, Friday or Saturday. I don't just when you consider that, and that was like the biggest aspect of maybe where Croatia could feel that they could dominate Brazil. You know, Casemiro, Lucas Paqueta, Neymar, sort of trifecta in the middle. I don't know, man. They just it seems like I I wouldn't be surprised if it happens, but it just seems difficult. Particularly, are they just going to sit back and absorb pressure, maybe? That's, like, the only thing. I feel that's what they'll do, honestly. Yeah, that's the only thing that I think they, like, simply can do, right? To just simply just get a win. Yeah. Wait till I hope, I hope the goalkeeper has a blinder. <laughs> but, but that seems to have worked for other European teams against Brazil in the group stage because the, the difference in goal scoring wasn't as much as versus Korea. Yeah, it was – I mean, the second game, Neymar wasn't there, so that's a bit of a caveat. I mean, he's just so good. And it took a while for them to get going against Serbia, though. But even then, so just in those two games, they didn't concede a shot on target, right? So it's, <laughs> yeah, that, that is they're true. Still, they're still almost in command of the game. It's just despite not, you know, I guess, garnering enough clear-cut chances for themselves. Yeah. Additionally, my question for this panel is that we've seen Portugal play well, we've seen France play well, England play well, Brazil play well. And one of the things that they all have in common is that that last game in the group stage, they had nothing riding on it. They were able to rest, rotate. I think Brazil lost, Portugal lost, France lost, and that one England beat Wales. But they basically played with a totally different team compared to the teams that we saw play in the last 16. So. Yeah. Yeah. Do we feel that was like a very big impact, that rest impact, especially when you're playing in that tournament where the games come so thick and fast? There's only one way to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, does anyone want to make a strong opinion on this? or? So just... you're, in other words, saying England are the best team in the world because they haven't uh... lost yet? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, well, so it, is, you know it is fascinating because you have the favorites and then Morocco and England are also unbeaten, right? Yeah. This, yeah. Which is, I don't know. That, like going to what Oscar said, it is fascinating in terms of seeing what we'll have to almost like see to find out. But True. Good, yeah, well, it's, also, it's also tough to say though because like, I mean, just teams have only played four games, which is just a small sample size, right? And three if you don't include those last group stage games where they rotated their team yeah so it's like despite the fact that like brazil and portugal like you know and these and even france uh, were just very very impressive is that to say that this following game they're also going to be just as good not necessarily yeah yeah that's what i'm trying to make right because france they had they rested their players before this game portugal as well Brazil as well. So maybe that's why, for example, in the game between Brazil and Korea, maybe Brazil is, is four zero better than Korea, but that rest factor also plays an impact, plays a role in this. Yeah, it definitely does. No, yeah, that's a very, very good point. Yeah. And I wonder for the teams that won big, how that's going to impact versus like the teams that won narrowly. Like is Portugal because the one so easily and we're able to like take up players, is that going to impact them against Morocco in a positive way? Because Morocco players got to play 30 extra minutes and penalties and stuff. Yeah, we can only find out yeah. it's Friday and Saturday. Yeah, yeah, we can only find out then. And and I guess, gentlemen, I'm going to put you guys on the spot again. 
now it's down to eight teams. Who's going to win this? Win the games of the World Cup. Win the World Cup. Or, or the games. You can start with the games, then the World Cup. Uh, Argentina will beat Netherlands. Brazil will beat Croatia. France will beat England. And Portugal will beat Morocco. Yeah, that's a, that's a very safe pick, but I, I can't blame you. <laughs> Macau. At this point, I, I don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, this is difficult. I'm just looking at this first one, Netherlands, Argentina. It's just, I feel if Argentina are able to get uh, that initial goal, mm-hmm. I just the fact that Netherlands will have to open up, I think, will make things difficult for them. And, and just with Messi as well, like, you have a player who's just a savant at kind of recognizing how teams play them, essentially. Yeah. It's like, you know, if they're sitting back, I'll just drop a bit more and just have more. He's just very good at that. And he does it usually in those first, like, initial minutes of the game. People say, like, he just, like, walks around, essentially. <laughs> but, yeah, I think Argentina just – that one I'm not confident on whatsoever. Um. I think Brazil will beat Croatia, England, France. I think France will beat England. And I think this one's also kind of tough because Morocco just, they just weren't, yeah, they were just almost, it felt like going for extra time, essentially. I mean, they did create chances, but I think Portugal showed today, or against um, Switzerland, that they'll probably edge them out yeah. just. Let me? Yeah, I think. Um, so I think there's one. I'll start with my, I guess, my sure picks. Um, Brazil to win against Croatia. I think like what Mikhail is saying, whoever scores first in Nether- um, between Netherlands and Argentina, I think wins. I think whoever scores first sort of wins because it would be a situation where I think, yeah, like you said, I think if Argentina scores first, Netherlands will have to sort of open up and then they can kind of capitalize. But if Netherlands score first, I don't think, I guess if Alvarez is playing, I'm actually quite scared of him. I'm actually more afraid of Alvarez than Messi. I'm not, I'm not joking. Like his finishing in and around the box has been quite. Devastating. Come on, Messi has scored like three goals so far. Come on. No, I know, I know. I, for me, it's almost like, I guess it's like, uh, it's like uh, okay, we like we know Messi, kind of like will be Messi to some degree, but then like that factor, you don't kind of, you haven't sort of game plan for, or you can't really game plan for at this point is Alvarez because he has, you know, sort of like. Uh, in terms of Argentina, like a small and small sample size, but then he's shown himself to be so effective for them. Yeah. So it's kind of like oh, his impact is definitely, you know, very like noticeable and trying to game plan for that might be, you know, I feel like he might be the X factor in that game. Not even Messi, but Alvarez, how he plays. But anyway, um, but I still expect them to win. Um, I'm here to make a prediction that I, I think the only way Portugal win the World Cup is if England beats France. <laughs> that is my pick. <laughs> so England beats France. Yeah. I think I think I, I so what I want to happen is England to beat France. But all my brain and just sort of like I guess most of my years of football of just kind of watching it is just like France should beat England. But if England by mistake eh, beat France. <laughs> Just, just chuck it as well. Just start writing Ronaldo's name. Just <laughs> start, start from Portugal. I don't know. Just start writing this because yeah. I feel Portugal will beat France. Um, because I think as well, because England would do this thing of like trying to respect France more and they wouldn't respect Portugal the same way. So because of that, that complexity is why I think if England beat France, they will lose Portugal in the mm-hmm. semifinal. But yeah. Um, Obviously, you already know Portugal to win against yeah. Morocco. Yeah, so that's my those are my picks. Yeah, I guess for myself, because the football gods have forsaken me this year, 
I expect them to forsake me again for the rest of this forsaken tournament. And I'm going to start with Netherlands beating Argentina, because why not? Brazil is going to win. Why not? Um, again, Portugal is going to win. Ronaldo is going to ride into the sunset. And finally, England, to make things worse for me, the dagger in my heart, England is going to be France. And I'm going to have a semifinal of four teams that I do not like. <laughs> That's my prediction. I love that semifinal, just so you know that. <laughs> Netherlands beat Brazil and England beat Portugal. Hey, wait, wait, is so Ronaldo's riding into the sunset or getting carried into the sunset? Get, getting carried into the sunset. <laughs> he's, he's, he's still in the sunset and sipping <laughs> tequila, whatever. Like he's chilling. All, all you guys are on your plane home back. I see he's like, you know. No, I'm still here with Argentina. Nah, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't sense the confidence in your voice anymore, Oscar. I'm like, no, <laughs> like, no, it's just, it's just, it's just like you're doing that thing where it's like, oh, I'm just okay because I have to. Okay, Messi. That's what I'm uh, this guy can, this guy can sense my heart from Bounce away. <laughs> I know, man. The com- the confidence uh, of this podcast is an all time low. Honest. Well, thanks for talking with us. Well, what I'll Actually, say is that. The path towards that Messi Ronaldo dreaded final is becoming clearer. <laughs> yeah, because so say to... Brazil lose to Croatia and England beat France, then you know, but looking at that final is getting closer. Like you know, that homework you've just been leaving throughout the holiday until the last day. Yeah, yeah, Mikhail, <laughs> you're gonna see yeah, something. But... Yeah, I was just going to say the the only one I think I would be surprised about is if Croatia beat Brazil. Yeah. I, like, didn't, something, just this Morocco one is just odd because they've been so good against like decent oppositions as well. I know Belgium weren't as good as everyone thought they'd be, but I mean, just to concede, I mean, Lumi said this earlier, simply just to concede an own goal thus far is uh, pretty impressive. We should and have just, it. <laughs> also, Yeah, I mean, also it's just a style of play against, like, Portugal. If they're sitting back, I honestly, sitting back, Bernaldo, I think, will end up having the big say in this game if Portugal don't have, like, a, a goal um, in the first half. Yeah, but with that being said, guys, who do you think has been the best player of this weekend? Who has been the best team? Um, I'll probably go first just to say Ramos and Portugal. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Oscar? Ramos and Port- Ramos and Morocco. Ramos and Morocco. Mikhail? Yeah, I can't argue with a hat trick and an assist. That's excellent. Ramos and uh, Portugal. Portugal. I guess I'll go with Ramos and not Portugal. I'm going to go with Brazil. So, yes. Anyways, guys, thanks again for coming on this podcast. I did my best to be cheerful and excited, even though I'm not. I'm crying inside. But it's always good talking with the boys about soccer and about this World Cup. And thanks again for coming. See you guys after the quarterfinals. Adios.